Aloha, everyone. My name is Rob Hack. I'm from the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. Uh, this morning, I'm at uh, the Foreign Trade Zone down here in Honolulu at Pier 2, where we used to do all of these webinars uh, live before the pandemic and, uh, and stream them out uh, uh, via Zoom. And now we're just trying to get back to doing them live again. So we have a few attendees down here at uh, Foreign Trade Zone, and we have uh, many more attendees by Zoom. So welcome to everyone today. The topic for today's export webinar is legal issues, contracts, and intellectual property protection, which I think is an extremely important topic. We cover this every few years. I think we haven't done it since before the pandemic, so I'm glad to be doing it again. And we have um, uh, two fantastic speakers who couldn't uh, be better uh, in terms of their expertise in, in sharing uh, legal knowledge with our uh, exporters. Before we jump into the talks, though, uh, we'll have a few words from Jamie Lum, who will talk uh, from DBET, and she will tell us uh, a quick overview of the High Step program for those um, who are not aware of it yet. Uh, Jamie, please, I have your website up. Mahalo, Rob, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this morning. Um, so we are happy to have, okay, sorry, I'm, I'm here in person and <laughs> um, we're, we're just happy to have um, our speakers today and I'm happy to be working with the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. So this series is part of what we call our high step or Hawaii State Trade Expansion Program which is an export development program that is funded primarily through uh, a grant that we receive from the U.S. Small Business Administration. And so um, uh, we do work with many partners like HPEC, like Rob and um, Hawaii Pacific Export Council and the Small Business Development Centers and the Women's Business Center um, with the Veterans Business Opportunity Center, um, several other state agencies um, to create um, um, an ecosystem, if you will, to help companies that are either new to export or are already exporting and want to um, expand further um, to help them um, really um, develop an export marketing plan or to improve upon their plan. That's part of uh, what, what the program is intended to do. And then there are certain activities that the program helps to fund um, to help companies get into the markets that they want to get into. So um, thank you, Rob. We have our uh, website up. So we actually have divided the program up into three components. As you'll see here, we have what we call our export readiness program, uh, which is of which this training session is a part of. So along with uh, HPEC, uh, we do a monthly um, session on various topics related to exporting, um, and some of them are market specific. Uh, again, these are intended to give companies uh, information that they can use uh, when they want to put together an export plan um, and just give them more information about what it takes to export in, in general. Part of our export readiness is also one-on-one -on -one, um, consultations with our various partner organizations. So if you're interested in High Step, um, we would ask you to submit a registration form. Um, you'll see on, on the right-hand side, you can um, click on the registration form. Um, and with that, when you submit that, um, we will then put you in touch with one of our partner organizations for a one-on-one, -on -one, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one-on-one -on -one consultation. Um, I think you were, uh, yeah. Thank you, Rob. So it, there's no cost to register and it doesn't obligate you to participate um, in any of the programs. It just basically gives you, it gives us information about your company and then how we can uh, move along in um, uh, assigning you to one of our partners to begin a conversation about what it is that your uh, company wants to achieve um, in exporting. And then they can um, begin there and seeing how they might be able to help guide you and see what other activities within the program um, may be able to help you. So that's where you would start. Um, so the high step registration 
Um, so, sorry, I veered off a little bit. So the component of export readiness, again, intended to do just that, gear companies up to be able to participate, um, to get involved in other activities. Um, the second component that we have is our uh, what we call our um, Hawaii pavilions. Um, these are trade shows that we've selected for uh, Hawaii companies to participate in. Um, with the funds that we have, we subsidize the majority of the cost for uh, being at the trade shows. So what we do is we will, um, uh, six months out before the, the, the trade show, we will go out and uh, recruit companies to participate under the Hawaii banner. Um, and maybe some of you may have, we had a big Made in Hawaii uh, conference yesterday. So that's that's another discussion. But um, we find uh, two things. We're trying to make it affordable for small companies to participate in these very large trade shows um, where we're talking like 100,000 buyers, 200,000 buyers at some of these um, trade shows. And the other thing is to um, uh, create a synergy uh, with other Hawaii companies to be under this banner of Hawaii, which is um, very powerful in these large trade shows to be able to um, bring attention to the companies there. So, um, you know, at these trade shows, you'll be able to find um, or at least start dialoguing with potential buyers, distributors, et cetera. Um, so that's what we're hoping to achieve through the Hawaii Pavilions. We've also added and Probably in the future, we'll have to rename this, this component Hawaii Pavilions. But we also have some other opportunities. Um, one of the events we have, which is not a trade show, so it's not a B2B show, it's a consumer show, is the Hong Kyu, um Hawaii Fair. And we work with the Hong Kyu, uh department store in Osaka, Japan. Um, that is um, also where companies can sort of do a little bit of uh, test marketing of their products. Um, to the Japanese market. Um, so while we can suggest companies to Hankyu really in that instance, Hankyu has kind of the final um, say in who gets selected for, for the show, but that is another opportunity. We also have um, another um, uh, pilot program this year, which is the uh, Makuake. It's an online um, opportunity. It's an e-commerce. Uh, in the Japan market. So that's another opportunity for companies to be able to participate in. So this would all be listed under our Hawaii pavilions. Um, and there's uh, more information there um, with who the contacts are. Um, and like I said, um, when we start recruiting for trade shows, then we'll have, uh, we'll contact companies separately um, about that, uh, but that will be based on your uh, high step registration. And then the final um, component is our what we call our company assistance, where we actually companies can apply to us for funding um, to help support uh, various costs within their export plan. Um, and this would be done on a reimbursement basis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we've actually already uh, selected the, the awards for this year. The cycle is normally we put the announcement out in November and the applications are due in January so that we give the companies a full year to be able to utilize the funding. Um, but to give you an example of some of the <clears throat> kind of costs that can be covered, uh, it can be used for airfare, it can be used uh, to help to pay for trade shows um, that the company wants to participate in. It doesn't have to be one of the Hawaii pavilions that is already being supported under the um, that category. Uh, it can be used for things like if you use the U.S. Commercial Service, um, which is under our U.S. Department of Commerce, they have various programs that companies, um, their their purpose is to help companies um, export in, in the particular country in which that, um, that office is located. And they have various services with a fee. So um, part of the funds can be used for that. Uh, it can be used for product testing. If you are taking a, if you have a product that, needs to be certified uh, before it can be sold in a particular country. It can be used for product testing. Uh, it can be used to ship um, uh, products, uh, sample products to potential buyers. Um, it can be also used for um, other things like market research, um, even uh, hiring a consultant 
Um, as long as it's not services that are already offered by the U.S. Commercial Service, um, if you're trying to look for a, a marketing um, en en entry strategy, you can um, work with a consultant. Um, so there's a, that's just an example um, of the, the types of expenses that can be covered uh, through the company assistance. Um, but again, um, all of the information is here on our website, um, the links, um, the link to our registration, that's where you would start. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always um, contact me or you can contact Rob, he knows how to contact me. Uh, but again, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, appreciate you all being here and um, enjoy the rest of the program. Thank wow. you very much. Um, Before we move on, and I have these uh, websites open, I just wanted to point out that uh, this video is, or this event is being recorded and it will eventually be uploaded to our archive of these events on the Hawaii Pacific Export Council YouTube channel. Uh, so I strongly recommend going back and looking through some of these uh, events, approaching a hundred videos now from the past several years. Um, some are very specific to say, for example, uh, exporting from the big island to exporting to Japan, exporting to Taiwan. Um, I think it's a it's an incredible archive, and I strongly suggest uh, our viewers to go back and look through here once in a while. And particularly when you find a topic that you're interested in, and you think I'd like to get a little more information there, please check our our archive first because we've probably covered it. Uh, while I have this open, I will point out quickly our um, next speaker is uh, Professor Mark Levin. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Mark and uh, you are ready to share yours when you're free. Okay, sound testing and now screen testing. How are we doing? We're good? Okay, I hope so. Um, you should be, Rob, are you, Rob, have you got a clear screen there? Yes, we're seeing it. Okay, great. So mahalo to Rob and Jamie and just the high step program, which we're just so fortunate to have uh, happening and available to us. Aloha to Seth. And there again, uh, we're really fortunate Seth knows his stuff on this IP. Um, so it's great that he's here. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and, and honored uh, by the invitation. And I just want to note that this will be super speedy because I teach this, this is a full semester course up at Richardson Law School in Manoa, and uh, we're just going to give you some real highlights um, in uh, 20 minutes time or so. So as I thought about how to introduce this to you, it came up with three ideas that I think uh, may give you what you need to know. There are some things that are unlikely. Um, or should be avoidable, um, but they're really important. So I want you to know about them. Secondly, there, uh, there are some things that are unavoidable, um, but they're not necessarily impactful. So you need to know about them and be ready to address them. And then a few other things that we might mention in moving forward. So let's begin with some things that are unavoidable. These are out there, you need to know it, um, but they are rarely legal. These are rarely going to come up. It's just the main point is that the laws are strict. U.S. law is strict with criminal penalties. So not to be messed around with in U.S. export law. The first one are the export regulations for goods outbound from the U.S. And what these pertain to are those that would have national security implications. My guess is that most of the folks watching this video, your prospective exports or the exporting that you're involved with uh, are not anywhere close to that. Think radar equipment, data encryption, drones, um, and the like would be the kind of thing. Or if you're looking at North Korea or 
or Russia as the possible destinations for your goods. And that is even if they are secondary destinations. Um, you can't have, uh, you can't turn a blind eye. Uh, there's sort of a red flags test that you ought to have known about something. Um, and so with those matters, um, there are very strict regulations. And as I said, criminal penalties to be addressed. But if you're selling Aloha shirts, um, Mac goods, uh, Mac nut candies, or many of the things that we're accustomed to seeing go out from Hawaii to the Hankyu department store in Osaka, it's not likely to be a problem. The same thing would be true for avoiding corrupt practices. So as I said, it, that should be avoidable. You just need to be paying attention to what's going on in your business dealings. Once again, um, you can't turn a blind eye. And so anything that would not pass what might be called a dirty diaper sniff test, you know, you ought to know, then you ought to be avoiding them and addressing them if something is happening as quickly as possible. Um, recently, this came up in the news. Um, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was added to the charges uh, against uh, the gentleman with the FTX scandal and financing issues. Uh, and that is really, really serious stuff. And keep in mind, this is United States law. So this is not a matter of that you can't uh, bri you know, commit bribery in Japan and be subject to J Japanese law, which may also be true, but this is you can't commit as a US business or individual, you can't be carrying out corrupt practices in, in foreign countries um, without uh, violating United States law. And the reason for that is that is also seen as having implications for national security uh, of the United States of America. The second category that I would mention is unavoidable matters. These are going to be happening if you're doing, if you're exporting. Uh, and, uh, but they're not necessarily impactful. You just want to know that they're there and be paying attention. So for example, uh, if you are exporting from the United States, your goods are going to be imported somewhere in a target destination. And therefore, in that circumstance, there will be customs declarations that need to be made and possibly duties, uh, money paid, essentially a, a tax on import um, in that target destination. This matter is usually manageable by declaring the goods and paying the duties. Uh, and there are specialists uh, who can help you address those issues. Um, secondly, you need to be avoiding contraband or restricted items in the import. Uh, so food, drug, and agricultural products may have restrictions. And be aware that different countries have their own rules of what is and isn't allowed. So if you're thinking about something that might be perfectly fine to bring into the United States, um, that may not be true with the, your target destination and you need to be paying attention there. I have the bullet here that says possible IP considerations, but I don't need to say much because that's exactly uh, what you're gonna be hearing about from uh, Seth Reese in a few moments. Um, I'll just note that with IP protections and IP issues, it's very much dependent on the product, on the industry, what it is that you're doing. Uh, but you should be aware that, again, these laws vary in different places and your protections can be limited. So it's a point to be considered uh, in advance and perhaps getting professional assistance. The third category of things to speak with you about today are basic know-how uh, concerning contracting and financing issues, which again, may have some differences 
from doing things at home here in the United States. So one is what law governs? Uh, US law is its own thing. And particularly if you are looking, for example, at Asia or many countries in the world, they not only have different laws, but they have very different legal systems. And what I mean by that is our legal system in the United States is what's ordinarily known as Anglo-American law, the common law. We basically shaped our legal system um, out of being an English colony a long time ago. Uh, Hawaii adopted the common law, uh, the Hawaiian kingdom adopted the common law. But that's in fact a minority legal system in the United States, in the world. And much of the world uses a legal system that came out of continental Europe, known as the civil law tradition. And it's just different. It's not better or worse, just like the imperial measurement system, feet and miles and pounds and degrees Fahrenheit may or may not be better than the metric system. But you need to understand if you're going abroad that those systems have different, people have different understandings of the law and how it operates. As well, there may be unfamiliar terms in an agreement. So there's something called INCO terms, these sort of standardized terms that are uh, common in international trade. Um, and then uh, this also goes over into financing. There's a, a tool available uh, called letters of credit in documentary transactions, which cost money to get, but uh, export offices and banks can help you um, with this. And it is a, a means of ensuring being paid in a way that might not be otherwise available to you because you don't wanna be chasing after someone for money on the other side of an ocean. Uh, now, the best way to ensure being paid is to get paid up front. Uh, but your counterpart uh, in the transaction may not be amenable to that. And so this idea of a letter of credit in a documentary transaction is another way where essentially both sides get some protections. The buyer gets protection for receiving the goods that they've contracted for, <clears throat> but you've got protection that if you ship those goods, you're gonna get paid. And again, I'm not going into details here, but they are things that you may want to be learning more about. Uh, go up a learning curve, and once you've got it, you've got it. The bottom line in this, my take, is that entry-level exporting should be very doable. Keep in mind, merchants have been exporting goods around the world about as long as we've had humanity and commerce. Um, and so it is doable, but you need to be paying attention. And another mechanism to help you is insurance uh, as well as getting advice. As to uninsurable risks, uh, as I mentioned, you need to be paying attention to legal compliance, IP protection, but the best approach that I've heard small and medium enterprises, business people share is start small. Keep your steps manageable. Don't leap. If something goes wrong, have a single deal be of the size that you can just walk away from it if everything goes bad, rather than needing to seek legal recourse, especially in a foreign location. Lastly, I would say, try to find and work with partners and counterparts that you know or can get to know. And that's not always an option, but it's certainly something to aim for that won't avoid all risks, but it can certainly minimize them. So mahalo for listening and good luck in your exporting.
Thank you very much, Professor Levin. That was wonderful. If anybody has questions, uh, please type them in now because uh, Professor Levin has uh, a busy schedule and he has to leave uh, immediately after this talk. So if there's anything otherwise, um, we'll move on. And thank you very much, Mark. That was a wonderful presentation. We're so happy to have you. It's nice to see you again. I'm glad I could be here. And I'm so excited it will be on YouTube. So uh, it's there for, for the future as well. Aloha to everyone. Great, thank you. Okay, our next speaker, excuse me. Our next speaker is Seth Rees. He's from uh, Watanabe Ing, and he's very specific to intellectual property. Um, we've had him speak a couple of times in the past, and um, we we're very happy to have him back as he is uh, uh, the top expert in Hawaii in terms of intellectual property protection. Thank you. Seth, come on up. And just press here. There we go. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm a top expert. I, I like to hear that I'm the top expert, but there's at least two or three people in town that might might take issue. Um, but I think that we'll all agree that that there's a, two or three of us who practice regularly in Hawaii, and and we're all um, pretty expert. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about intellectual property for export. Um, and let's see, it's working. Um, so, so basically, uh, we're going to start with the types of intellectual property. I don't know if this is too basic for some of you, but we'll go through it fast. There's generally four categories of intellectual property. Um, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. The easiest one to protect is copyrights because it's automatic. The most difficult one is patents. They're expensive and difficult to get. And trademarks are the one that's probably most relevant to exporters. So we're going to talk about that the most. Is it about half an hour? Yeah. How much time you want? <clears throat> so let's talk quickly about patents. Patents are inventions. Uh, in <clears throat> the United States, they're defined as new, non obvious, and useful processes, um, machines, manufacture, composition of matter. Each country has their own laws regarding patents, but but pretty much the, the laws are harmonized. So even though other countries will just describe inventions a little differently, um, mo most of the test is, is fairly similar, fairly equivalent. And so this is not everything. You can have a lot of inventions. There's a lot of people have inventions and they don't they don't make the grade. It's hard, hard to demonstrate that something's not obvious and at least in America and most countries of the world, um, a lot of a lot of what's going on on the internet, which they call business methods, are, is not protectable. So, so even though, so most most of the nifty things that we use, software-wise on computers, um, they're they're not patentable. Although a few a few of them are. Um, it's it's uh, like everything else in the intellectual property world. The registrations are country by country. So if you have a patent in the United States, it doesn't give you protection anywhere else in the world. You have to go to each country. And because patents have to be new, if you don't do your filing in every country within a year or under the treaty within 30 months, you lose your right to get protection entirely. So you have one shot at it before you disclose or within one year of disclosure, depending on the country. Uh, and there are certain tools that will help you make use of that, that rule. And the best one is uh, a convention. We're gonna talk a little bit about conventions, which are treaties between countries that help uh, implement uh, intellectual property protection. For patents, the major treaty is the Patent Cooperation Treaty or PCT. So that allows you to take an application in one country and file it in multiple countries. It also gives you 30 months to file to, to file applications in, in each country. But at the end of the day, you still have to file individual applications into each country 
it gets very expensive, but you have to figure that out right away. In other words, if you have an invention and you're considering patenting, getting protection, you have to do that. Um, presumably, you would do something before the first disclosure, but certainly within the year of the first disclosure. So again, you, you need to consult somebody if this is something you're thinking about, okay? Copyrights, copyrights are easy because they're automatic. If you, if you create something uh, and it's works of, uh, original works of authorship, so it, it's things like books and movies and music and sculptures, we call it content. Um, you create it, you own it. And, and again, the, the copyright laws in each country are different, but they're very harmonized, they're very similar. So if you create something in the United States, you automatically get protection. There is registration provisions in very selected countries. The only ones I'm aware of currently are the United States and Philippines, but the registration is not for the protection, it's for remedies. So if you don't register, you still own it. If you do register, you get additional legal remedies such as enhanced damages and attorney's fees if you sue somebody. But that's only within the United States. Registration has no meaning in foreign countries because there are no registration requirements other than the Philippines that, again, that I'm aware of. Um, the two big international treaties, and there's actually one, only one that's important now, there, there are two, the Universal Copyright Convention or UCC and the Berne Convention. The United States was a member of only the UCC for many, many years, but there was a number of countries, particularly European countries, that didn't want to join the UCC because it required certain formalities that their law didn't, didn't uh, recognize. And so the United States finally, and this is true in many of the IP uh, conventions, we're, we were late jumping on the boat. So the Berne Convention was the big convention. Everybody was a member. And because we wanted our citizens to have rights in all the countries that the Berne Convention provided rights, we finally amended our copyright laws to require less formality so that we could join the Berne Convention. So now that's the main convention. And really what it says is because copyright is automatic, if, if you create something, you have rights not only, not only uh, in the United States, you have rights in every country that's a member of the Berne Convention, I'm not sure how many countries, but I, it's over 100, and it's all the countries that most of us would care about exporting to. So that's good to know that you have um, rights automatically upon creating something uh, in most countries of the world. Um, Can I ask you a quick question sure. before you go on from this? Um, this question has come up before from some uh, exporters. Let's say you're, you've, you've created a website in English. Uh, you, that's copyrighted, right? What you've created. If it's original. Yeah. But in order to get copyright protection in Japan, right. would you have had to translate that into Japanese? No. Exactly. So, so that's a good question. Um, you, what you do is you have protection for what you created in all countries of the world that are a member of the burn, which again is most of the countries of the world automatically. Your rights in each country are defined by that country's laws. So you might have a little more, a little less protection for your work than in the United States, depending on their copyright laws, but they're not that dissimilar. But you, so you would have protection for the English language version. Now, under US law, a translation is co considered a derivative work. And so when you have a a creation in one language, you control the content for other languages. If somebody translates without permission, that's an infringement under US law. I couldn't tell you about the law of, of all the other countries. I suspect they have something similar, but I shouldn't presume. So I would have to either research that or, or talk to a, a copyright attorney in the country and say, is, is this rule also the case in that country? So, so if it's something important, it's always a good idea to find out. Um, I guess, you know, I, when Mark gave his presentation, he says, you know, you don't, you don't want to have to hire foreign counsel. 
um, because it's expensive, you know, and, and I agree with that. But I would also say that the United States, uh, there's, there's only one area, well, the United States has the most expensive attorneys in the world. So, so one nice thing about hiring foreign counsel is they tend to be a little less expensive or, or a lot less expensive, depending on the country, than U.S. attorneys. So, so it's good not to have to hire an attorney, but if you do have to hire an attorney in a foreign country, you, you might find that it's, it's uh, less expensive and not, not, not so bad. Um, okay, so trade secrets. Well, trade secrets, it, it takes a little more work than a copyright. A copyright, all you do is create it and it's protected. A trade secret, you have to do what you have to do is you have to keep it secret. And sometimes that takes non-disclosure agreements or, or you know, um, policing your employees, making sure people don't spill the beans. Um, trade secrets are for anything that can be kept secret and derive value from being secret. So the typical examples are the Coke formula, formula for Coke. Um, it can be uh, um, client records, uh, things like that. So, in the United States, we have protection through state law. Uh, Hawaii has a statute. Every all, every state or every almost every state has a statute. The federal federal law came into effect in 1996. So, for people doing interstate or international commerce, which would be exporters, you also have protection under federal law. But does that help you in federal countries? Well, it helps you in federal countries if the guy who, who uh, spilled the beans in a foreign country is amenable to service in the United States and others can be sued in the United States. But that might not always be true. However, many foreign countries will have an equivalent law. And so if somebody um, discloses your trade secrets in China or in Korea, you may very well find equivalent law, which may not be as good as the U.S. law, or it may be. So again, this is something you have to consult with foreign counsel um, because the laws may be there, but they, they work differently. Um, trademarks. Well, trademarks, we're going to talk the rest of the time about trademarks because I think they're the, probably the most, the most important thing for exporters. Trademarks are indications or designations of source or origin. It tells you where a product or services come from, who's behind them, and that helps you decide if, you know, if it's good quality. We always select things based on the marks. Marks can be a words only, can be designs, can be composite mark, which is a combination of a design and, and a word. Um, designs sometimes are referred to as logos. It can also constitute smell or sounds. Uh, the NBC chimes, I think it's NBC, and the, the, the um, startup of, of uh, the Microsoft startup, the, those are sound trademarks. Um, so it, most, most of the times you were working with designs or words. Um, trade names are, are not themselves protectable on the federal level or in foreign countries, but when they're used with respect to goods and services, they become trademarks if they're used with goods and service marks if they're used with services. So again, trademarks, trade names are protectable at the state level in the United States, not at the federal level, but oftentimes a name when used with goods or services becomes a mark and can be registered. Um, what's important to understand is you know, we mostly think about trademarks as protecting businesses and counterfeit marks as, as, as hurting businesses because, um, because, you know, you're buying something thinking it's from Rolex, but it's really a, a cheap imitation. So that's to protect the business, but it's also to protect the consumer because, um, you know, we want, we, you know, if we buy, if we buy the, the counterfeit watch and it breaks down, you know, who's hurt or because we want to resell it at, you know, at a good price, and we think we think we think it's a real one. Um, the consumer gets hurt, and this is true of of all countries of the world. They they recognize that they're protecting not only the businesses but consumers, and that that affects the way that trademark law is construed and enforced. Um, there's even been um, discussions about how counterfeit airplane parts, you know, can can. Can, can contribute to airplane accidents. I, I'm not sure that's happened yet, but but there there's always a discussion of that about you know how, 
how a counterfeit good can hurt people as well as businesses. Sorry, before you move on, I'm sure yeah. some of our, our attendees would like to have a little more information about trade names, trademark, service marks, because those are probably some terms that they haven't really uh, heard before or delved into too much. Can you give an example of a trade name and a trademark and a service mark? What would that look like or sound like? Yeah. Okay. So, so a trademark is is trademark is something that's used. It's it's a it's a word or a design normally. You or, usually see TM. Right. TM or a, TM is for if it's not registered in the United States, R with a circle as if it's registered. So TM is trademark because it's for goods. And so that would be like the swoosh on the Nike um, sneaker, um, the uh, the the golden arches for McDonald's, um, the Coca-Cola des designation design. Those are all goods. Trade name is a name used with the business, but not necessarily with the public. So, so IBM is a trademark for goods. International business machines may be a mark, but it's certainly a trade name. We usually don't hear that the full name. So, so you know, I would say almost all trade names become trademarks or, or service marks, but but there may be some some people who use their business name, but don't use it in public just with the banks, you know, and on their taxes and that sort of thing, something doing business as. And in that case, that trade name may not reach the level of a trademark or service mark because the public doesn't see it. So if the public doesn't see it, there's not, not, not an issue with protecting it. Um, the service mark is the same thing for services. In other words, if a trade name is used for services and McDonald's is a trade name used for services, um, l and l barbecue is a trade name used for services um so so that's so 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 that becomes a service mark and little s m if it's not registered and again the r circle with r with encircled r with if it's used for services so okay, um yeah so we're going to talk more about trademarks so ho hopefully it'll become a little clearer but you know feel free to jump in with questions i I don't know if I'll see questions here but okay well um so you feel free to interrupt if you see another question that, and otherwise we'll talk about questions at the end so how how do you get trademark rights well this is really really important because in the united states we're used to something called common law and mark talk, talked a little bit about that if you use a mark in the united states you gain rights if you register it you gain more rights okay in the foreign countries almost every foreign country except a few you have to register to gain rights. And that's why you may have good rights in the United States. You go to another country and you find out that some guy who wants to imitate you registered your mark there for themselves. And then you're locked out. You're, you have limited remedies. So that's why it's very important if you're planning to go to a foreign country to do business under a brand, you go and get a registration there first before, before you get important, before... There's a lot of copycats in this world, and and so, so you know, once the cat's out of the bag, if you're success, if you're not successful, nobody's going to copy you. If you're successful, you're going to get copied. Um, so in the United States, you can you can register it everywhere in the world. You get copy, uh, trademark rights from registration in the United States and in other Commonwealth countries, and that's like the England and Canada. You can also get. Um, rights through use. There is an exception, and that comes from the Paris Convention, which is the oldest IP convention from the 1800s. If you have a famous mark, then people who try to register your mark in foreign countries can be displaced. And But famous marks are things like McDonald's. They're, they're, they're marks that have been out there that most people in the world recognize. And so small business will not be able to use this exception to the rule. Small business will have to plan ahead and Try to get their registrations in those foreign countries before they become known. Um, the the scope of of these rights. So we talked about how intellectual property exists in each country individually. Now we did say that under the copyrights, it's automatic and you get reciprocal um, protection in in all the burned countries, which are most of the countries of the world. So that's automatic, but it's still defined country by country. And so trademarks are still defined country by country. 
And because it, it requires registration in most countries, you have to go and get your registration in most countries, like with patents, okay? Uh, there is some, some conventions that make that easier, but it is country by country, except for limited regional conventions. And Europe has one. So Europe has a European trademark. They also have a European patent now. That's very recent. So if you register a European trademark, you get protection for your mark in all 27 countries of the EU. There's a couple of tricks here because, you know, people who are tourists in Europe, they think, well, Norway is part of Europe, Switzerland's part of Europe, and maybe Malta is part of Europe. Well, those three countries don't belong to the EU um, trademark union. So you get protection in 27 countries, a lot of countries, Poland, a lot of some Eastern European countries, but you have to do, if you want Switzerland, Norway, and Malta, you have to do them separately, okay? Uh, there's also a Benelux, which is kind of just historic, but three of the small countries in Europe have a trademark union. So if you want to register in those countries, you usually do them together. If you don't want the rest of Europe, if you're doing the rest of Europe, you get those countries with the European filing. And there's the French-speaking African countries who have a union as well. So most of this won't be relevant to you, but the EU is very relevant because you can get with a single filing 27 countries very efficiently. You know, it's it's uh, you know it's a shame that maybe other uh, there's not a, um, a Asian trademark union. So so you know we don't have to do those countries individually, but there is something we're going to talk about. Uh, that helps the efficiency of international filings. So just to reiterate, yeah. so many of our Hawaii exporters will first and foremost be interested in Japan, right. and then Korea, right. Taiwan, and China, Singapore, uh, East, or East Asia, and Southeast Asia. Um, you're saying that there's nothing like the EU system for Asia. Correct. It's it, all individual countries. So far, and I haven't heard any discussions, you know, I think... Yeah, con countries tend to be a little bit uh, difficult because, and it's the trademark attorneys that are making them difficult because, you know, the trademark attorneys have enjoyed being being hired by foreign counsel individually and not bypassed. And these conventions allow you to bypass local attorneys. So it kind of hurts their pocketbooks. Because, um, you know, tw 20 years ago, there was not, I, I'm sure, I'm not sure how, how long the EU, EU union was there, but Years ago, there was no choice but filing country by country. Now there's some really good choices. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to change the, the, the attorney world and tell them that you, you have to compete harder. But that, that is happening. And we're, we're going to talk about some. some... So one last question on this. How about um, free association? A lot of our Hawaii exporters work sending, sending products to Marshall Islands and uh, places like this who are not U.S., but U.S., and how does that work? Certainly Guam is... Yeah, um, okay, I can't, I can't answer Guam. Guam is, is part of the United States for purposes of the Lanham Act, which is our trademark act. So if, you, if you're worried about Guam, you can do a local registration in Guam, just like you can do a local registration in the state of Hawaii, but Guam is covered by the federal trademark law. So if you have a federal registration, you are covered in Guam. That's not true for the other islands. I can't tell you the status of every island. I think some of them have what's called local protection. It would be probably very limited protection, you know, because their laws aren't as sophisticated and developed. But, but there, may be, there may be fairly good protection, and you would have to talk to local counsel. If, if that's where you're doing business, you know, talk to local counsel. Well, just... More of our exporters are interested in New Zealand. Australia, but I assume those are all yes. covered under the Commonwealth uh, countries. That no, no, they're they're. Um, oh, I mean, they're they're going to be covered under the Madrid, the Madrid, which we're going to be talking about. Okay, so but they're not part of a union. You can't do all of it together like you can with Europe. So Europe is unique. I mean, there is the Benelux, but as I explained, that's only if you're concentrating in those three countries. There is the Convention for French-speaking African countries, but I've never used it. I mean. That's, you know, that's not a big market for us, but um, otherwise it's country by country, but there is something called a Madrid. And here, here we're talking about it. So, 
So there is the Paris Convention, and I mentioned that's from the 1800s and gives reciprocal protection. So if you have a registration in the United States, you can go to Japan, Australia. I think there's there's a whole bunch of countries, 130, that are members, and they'll give you a registration not based on use there, but based on your registration in the United States. You still have to be first. You still It still can't be a blocking registration in those countries, but it gives you the opportunity to ask for a registration based on your, your U.S. registration. And because it's reciprocal registrations from people in all those countries, they can ask the same thing from the United States. Okay, But there's something that much better. Yeah, so every, yeah, except for Europe, you have to do everything individually. Um, but so, so if you're going to go to the individual countries and do a registration, you have to go through foreign council. I can't do it for you from the United States, except if you go through what's called the Madrid Convention. Now, the Madrid Convention, the U.S. joined it late, as usual, but but it's fa it's fairly new. And we joined, I think, in 1989 um, while I was practicing, and it transformed what you, the U.S. could do in terms of getting foreign protection because it, it can allow you to file into the, the hundred some odd countries. I think it's 113 countries through a central filing that's inexpensive. And I can do that from my desktop. Okay, So all of a sudden, a U.S. attorney can help you get registrations throughout the world inexpensively, not instead of going country by country through a, a trademark attorney in those countries. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. And as I explained, the, the foreign counsel are typically less expensive than U.S. counsel, and the foreign filings are typically less expensive, except in certain countries. Middle East is very high. And Japan, Japan is not kind of on par with the U.S. So, so, you know, some European countries are on par with the U.S. Um, so what, how, how does the Madrid work? It's based on a U.S. application, if you're a U.S. If you're, so I had a, a, a client from Vietnam just yesterday. He wants me to file into Canada, U.S., and Europe. I told him, I'm sorry, because you're not a, Viet you're not a U.S. citizen. Your, you know, your business is not located here. I can't file the Madrid for you from the United States. Ask your Vietnamese attorney to file from Vietnam because your rights under the treaty come from Vietnam. That's where your business is. So I lost that client. Well, that, so he said, fine, he'll ask his, but that's the right thing to do. You know, that's, that's the way the, the treaty works. Um, so it's based on, on, on a US, if you're here and most of you will be, based on a U.S. Uh, application. You can also have a, a real and effective business. Again, that's large companies that have multiple locations. So I could file on behalf of a European country that has a real physical presence in the United States, an office and operating. That's enough, okay? Um, and and this works until, until there's an objection, which sometimes there is, and then we have to file. We have to work with foreign counsel to respond. And, and so we had... We end up with relationships with foreign counsel in most countries because even going through the Madrid, we still need their help from time to time. So let's talk about the individual route. So if you're only doing one or two foreign registrations and that's all you'll need, then you don't necessarily go through the Madrid because it might be less expensive and more efficient to go directly through foreign counsel. So generally your US counsel will contact foreign counsel and, and make arrangements for a filing. If you already have a U.S. registration, it may be based upon that because we talked about the Paris Convention and reciprocal protection. Um, if, you know, but, but you can also file in advance of filing in the U.S. You can file foreign. It's pretty easy. In the old days, there was a lot of formalities with what's called a power of attorney. You had to go through consulates. You have to circulate it around. It was a real pain. Now, almost every country has gotten rid of that formality. The exceptions are the Middle East and a couple of South American countries. Um, I think it's because they get paid every time they, the embassy stamps a piece of paper, but th those are still very painful to do. But every other country, we, we can get filed in a day or two you know, with a foreign country. We just reach out to somebody we've been working with and it gets filed. If you do an individual registration in the country, uh, you also have to renew individually. So at usually every 10 years, you know, your, your foreign attorney will say, hey, it's time to, to 
to renew and we'll just say go ahead and it's it's relatively inexpensive but it is country by country the the great new thing that happened um well in 1989 that's 20 it's 20 years now uh, is is the U.S. joined the Madrid, which gives you a central filing route to 130 countries. And it's 114 members, and so I guess that's that's probably the EU because one of the members is the EU, so that's why you get more countries than members. But that's a lot of countries, and probably every well everywhere but the Pacific Islands and a few other places. Um, it's a central application that we file from our desktop. Again, we can file it in a day or two. Uh, we don't need a lot of time. You, when you file, you designate which countries you want protection in. So, you know, you list what, whatever. Um, and you can also, once if you have this in place already, you can go in later on and designate more countries. Um, so here's my here's a question that I'm sure our audience would want to hear. I'm drinking coffee out of this cup from a pretty famous uh, well, so. Starbucks. We can mention it. Okay. So. When they started this company in Seattle, I think, right. they weren't thinking probably that this logo is going to show up in very far flung places in the world. They probably went to uh, SAP and said, SAP, we'd like to register our logo for the United States and maybe uh, Japan. But then how do, you, how do you then add on later is that a pretty straightforward uh, process okay well this, it's a good question again so i think i think going back to what they did i don't know what they did but there's usually two scenarios one a small business that doesn't realize it's going to get really important those guys are probably going to do things after the fact and may find they're blocked then there are people who launch you know with a lot of money or either an established business launching a new brand or, or you know, with Shark Tank and all that, everybody gets their ducks in the row. And so they may have actually filed all over the place before they launched. So that also happens. But let's, let's assume they didn't. Um, if you file in the United States or anywhere in the world, again, under the Paris Convention, you get a six-month priority date. So if you file anything else that's the same within six months, you get to go back to your first filing date. So the conservative advice, the best advice is to file a first application, trademark application. Usually it'll be in the United States if you're US, but it could be somewhere else. You file whatever else you need to file within six months because it goes back to that first date. And anybody who's being the copycat within that six months gets knocked out, okay? That's the conservative advice. If you don't if you don't get to do that, you know, you file when you can. And, you know, you again, if you're doing it through the Madrid, you can do multiple countries at once. So let's say you didn't expect to get famous. You all of a sudden got famous. You're worried about people jumping on the bandwagon and blocking you in other countries. You go right away with the Madrid and you, you name all the countries. As soon as that application gets filed, you get a date. And they do it the next day. They're too late. Okay. So... So ho hopefully that works. And, you know, what we found is when we get blocked, it's because the people really sat on their butt and didn't do anything for a long time. Or the blocking mark was there before. It's just a similar mark. It's not a copycat. And there's nothing we could have done about it anyway. Okay, that, that happens. Um, you don't always get every mark you want in every country. Even if, even if you were unique and you weren't, you know, you were first, there's a similar mark out there. You're not. You're not going to get it uh, in that country. And then there's workarounds. Um, so you file. So as, as I said, you know, I file from my desktop. We designate countries. It first goes to to Geneva, a place called WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is the international. It's a UN organization that administers tr IP treaties and so it, it will it will examine it and almost always it will just issue it because it's not examining against anything it's just to see if the format is good so within a month or two you get a, what's called an international registration we call it an IR and then who you know let's say I've designated five countries and one of them is the EU so I get my four plus the 27 countries in the EU so, I, so how many is that? That's 31 countries. So it's going to the EU for examination. It's going to the four other countries. And that takes between one month and 
18 months, depending on the backlog in the country. And I either get a grant or a refusal. Okay, if I get a grant, I'm done. I have protection in that country, just the same as if I filed individually in that country. And I don't have to worry about it. If I get refused, then I have to cut. I have to hire an attorney in that country. Almost always, once in a while, we can fix it from our desktop, but usually I have to hire an attorney in that country to try to fix it. There are fixable refusals and there are non-fixable refusals. Um, and it just depends on circumstances. And it's no different than if you file in the United States. Sometimes you file into the United States and we get refusals that really can't be fixed and some that can be. Some we, we you know, we will we'll argue for, for a, you know, we can go up to technically the Supreme Court arguing the issue, but usually we argue a little and if it ha hasn't worked, we, we try something different. Um, so what happens to get refused? Well, well, you we, we look at the refusal. We figure we have to talk to our client. We figure is this something we want to try to fix? If it is, we go to a foreign a foreign council. We get their opinion. We get a budget from them, uh, and then they argue it. Uh, most countries you can argue. You get one one bite of the apple at the tri the trademark office level. If it doesn't work, there's a board level. There's a few countries, China and I think Turkey, so far. You, you have to go appeal right away. They only, once they refuse you, you're done there. You have to appeal, but you keep, can keep going. So again, if it's important enough to you, you keep going. If it's, if it's China, it's, it's relatively inexpensive to argue it, at least for the first tier. Um, a place like Turkey, a little more, more money. And so again, it depends on the country. Um, but, so, you know, I'd say... The refusals, you know, a third of them, there's nothing can be done. You have to, you know, have a workaround, like try a different similar mark in that country. Two thirds of them on average, there's things we can do to get past the refusal, but it does cost a little bit of money. Okay, what about renewal? Well, if you're country by country, as I mentioned, you have to go to the attorney in that country and say, can you please renew the mark? It's usually not very expensive because it's very routine. It's not, not a lot of work. Um, if it's the Madrid, and let's say you, you have the Madrid and you have your EU and those four countries on the Madrid, all you do is you pay you pay a fat fee. It's not all that much, but it's because the each country gets a, a piece of the fee. You you do again, I do it from my desktop. I pay the fee. It takes me a very little amount of time. I don't have to charge a lot to my client for my time, but you know, we pay each country for the next 10 years. So we could it's a central renewal. So very cheap, very easy. Okay. Again, if it's more than two countries, that's the way you want to do it. There are a few exceptions. So the United States has always required proof of use at year five. So even though you're registered, you can't maintain your registration unless you show I'm still using it between year five and year six. And they do that to get rid of the dead, what they call the dead wood, marks that are no longer being used. Because if you have a registration for a mark that's no longer being used, it's blocking somebody else from being able to use that mark. Well, the Philippines, I don't know why, but you know, they, it's interesting. The Philippines always have laws that mirror the United States because I guess of our, our influence in the Philippines following the war. They, they incorporate a lot of our IP laws, but for some reason they, they want to see use a lot more often. Some, again, I think it's because they get income. Because, you know, each time you have to file something in a country, you pay a filing fee and you pay their attorneys. But the Philippines, they, they want to see use at year three and year five. Um, and then maybe because of the Madrid, you know, it deprives the local attorneys of money. And so the year three may just be for the Madrid applications. But anyway, you have to use their attorneys to do that. Even if you have a Madrid application, even if you can renew it automatically at 10 years through the Madrid you still have to pay their lo local attorneys to, to demonstrate use at year three and year five. And there, it looks like there's other countries joining the bandwagon, okay? So even though I think it's the US and the Philippines only, although there may be some other countries doing it, I think we're gonna see more and more of this. And why? Because getting rid of dead wood is important because what's happening is throughout the world, trademark registers are getting full. There are more and more marks being filed, and so there's more and more refusals based on sim similar marks. And so the, the, it's in the public interest to get rid of the dead wood. And how do we get 
rid of the dead wood except by asking people to prove they're still using it, okay? So I think we're gonna see a lot more of this. So it's not gonna be quite as easy and inexpensive to maintain foreign registrations as it has been. But remember, the US always required it at year five. So, so in this case, other countries are copying us in a way, but there's other reasons for that, which we won't get into. I think I mentioned this, that if you're filing into more than two countries, the Madrid will probably save you money. One reason you might not want the Madrid is you can contour the filing for the, the, each country. So in other words, if you file in a given mark, it's gonna be that mark that you file that's, that's registered under the Madrid in each country. You can't modify it. Sometimes when you're filing into a country, typically Asia and China in particular, they will find reasons to block your mark. And the only way to get protection in that country is to modify it in a way to avoid the conflict. Um, that happens more in China than most countries, but it can happen in every, in every country. Um, so, so a lot of times when we're filing into a foreign country, we have to modify the mark. You can't do that through the Madrid. The Madrid won't let you modify a mark. It has to be the same mark. So that's what, another reason why you might not go, or you might file Madrid, but for the certain Euro, and this is really typical for certain Asian countries where we have problems, we file individually in those countries. We use the Madrid for Europe and, and other countries. Um, if you want an idea of how much your Madrid will, will cost, and, and it's kind of fun because you might say, oh, I only want Japan now, but I want, want these five other countries. And you mentioned Australia and New Zealand, they're Madrid countries. You, you go to this website and you just check off the boxes and it'll give you an instant price. And you have to add your attorney fees on there, but because it's a fairly easy process, the attorney's fees won't be very significant, okay? So you can get an idea. So, you know, you, should I file in one country or should I file in these six? You'll you can find out instantly. It's in French francs, Swiss francs, but usually Swiss francs are, you know, just a little bit more than a dollar. Um, how much does filing individually cost? Well, you can probably file for under $500 in certain Asian countries and maybe South American countries. You can shop around. If you shop around too much, you might find a low cost filer that the quality isn't as good. And then there's higher cost filers that sometimes are justified because they can give uh, very, you know, they have workaround strategies that you won't get from the, from the discount attorneys. Um, and then other countries are, are very expensive. The Middle East is very expensive. Saudi Arabia and the UAE, a lot of people want to file in the UAE. It costs thousands and thousands of dollars for a simple application. And it also has a very arduous um, legalization process for the POA. And because we're in Hawaii, it's it, we have to have a courier run around DC to get signature from the Department of State and all sorts of things. It's doable, but it's not fun and it's not easy. And if you need protection in those countries, you got to spend the money. Um, the interesting thing is it's the government fees that are so high. So if, I, I'm not sure, you know, it might cost, you know, several thousand dollars to get a simple registration in the UAE. 90% of it is government fees and the poor trademark attorneys are getting just a little bit of it. So, so and they take their money up front because if they get stiffed, you know, they're, they're out a lot of money. So many of our companies in Hawaii have been attending this annual golf food show uh -huh. uh, where everybody comes from around the golf area to, to, yeah. to buy uh, some golf. Yeah. And so it's that's a relevant topic. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, I have people say, well, you know, we want a trademark thing. I say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's really expensive and, you know, it, it's uh, tedious to, to, you know, and they say, well, I want it anyway. And, and we do it. And, you know, the good thing, it's interesting because the good thing I think about these two countries, Saudi and UAE, and I'm picking on them because they're the most expensive and most difficult, but the other Middle Eastern countries like Egypt, they, they're still tough. They still have formalities. Um, they, they have a system where they, they do a, a, a search, I think through the, the trademark office. So if they tell you they can get something, they can get it. I've never had a situation where somebody says, you know, the search looks clean, you'll get it, and they don't get it. Um, so, so I like that because uh, most countries, you, you get a search 
uh, and that's a prediction and it's maybe 80 or 90 percent accurate but the examiner may still find something that the searcher doesn't because the search is done exterior to the office and not interior to the office so even though it's very expensive in the uae um, and there's a variety of attorneys but the price doesn't change much because the price is almost always government is most mostly government fees although we still have preferences of who we like to work with there but if they say they can get it to you for you they they will so you won't have a, a situation where you spend a lot of money anticipating a registration and don't get it it could happen but it's it's quite rare are the renewal fees typically the same as the original filing fee uh it's 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 not the same but it's typically sim parallel in the sense that it'll be very expensive in those countries that where the filing was expensive and it'll be inexpensive in those countries where the filing so so hong kong and, and taiwan and by the way hong kong has a separate regime from china because of the legacy of how Hong Kong became part of China that may end one day, but you still have two registration systems. Taiwan has its own and Hong Kong and Taiwan and China, they, they have very low filing fees. Um, can get expensive if you run into problems, but otherwise it's inexpensive. They would have low renewal fees. I expect the UAE would have high renewal fees. So. Okay, and this is the other thing is, um, you know, it's not a black hole. You 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 know you 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 can ask foreign counsel for you know how much is this going to cost and what what's the likelihood of success. Um, and, and they'll tell you uh, if if it's a reputable firm, they'll tell you. And you you know you can, you can go in with your eyes open. You don't have to feel like you're in a foreign country and they they're going to charge you money and who knows what you're going to get. Um, I'd say for the most part. Uh, the the foreign associates are reputable. There are certain discount discount houses that, and in the United States too. I mean, you can get a very inexpensive trademark uh, attorney or, or or agency in the United States, and you know it's bulk work. And for the difficult filing, you the result may not be good. So the same thing in foreign countries. Um, most of them that we've worked with are very are diligent and workable. Sometimes the English language skills are lacking and so that can cause problems because you don't really understand what they're trying to tell you um so if you can you know but a lot of them have have very uh have re, you know a lot of them do communicate well in english and 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 provide a good result you know they provide a, a good good pro but it's not a black hole you can ask how much it's going to cost you can ask how likely i am to succeed and the, generally the results are in line with what they tell you so um enforcement okay so this is the other part of everything and you know you can get your registrations but it doesn't mean people are going to behave and you still may have to do something uh cease and desist letters registration with border control i think mark made a, a brief reference about getting stopped at the border um so if let's say you're starbucks i don't want to pick on them and they somebody else registered before them in in an Asian country, we'll say South Korea, um, because we've had problems. But uh, we shouldn't pick on Starbucks because I'm sure they didn't have a problem. But let's say, let's say somebody gets to South Korea before you. They they saw your successful operation and they registered in South Korea, and and so you so you're blocked effectively. And you try to ship into South Korea. Well, they can they can prevent you from shipping in with your own brand because somebody else has registered your brand there and not you. And of course, they'll try to make money off 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 your goodwill um, by by selling to to people in South Korea, believing that they're getting the authentic pro product and they're not. Um, so so that's so so you, so you can you have the registration in, in in these countries. You can register with the border control and have have counterfeit products stopped at the border, and then you can do contested proceedings where you try to. Uh, cancel, oppose, or cancel somebody's filing in a foreign country. Um, so, so uh, cease and desist letters. If you write something, if you have your attorney from the United States write a letter into a foreign country, there you, you you're not. You might get results. Um, I think Europe more than Asia. But if you have an attorney from that country write the letter, you're much more likely to to get get a result because you know that 
we really don't have rights to practice in foreign countries and you know it may it may even be against the law of a foreign country for us to to send the letter in the first place so uh, you're well advised plus they'll use the right language they'll know the law and there are, the laws are similar there's for example taking south korea for example they have a lot of unfair competition law so if you mention unfair competition in your letter they they may get it but you know uh south korea council will be able to cite to the statute and the provision and more more likely to be successful um although they like to fight in that country i noticed in certain countries where trademark trademark fights are really common south america korea and india india we, we there's a lot of a lot of uh, what we call contested proceedings um we talked about registration for border control and again you need you would need the assistance of foreign counsel if you're going to want to register like a south korean registration with south korean uh border control uh contested proceedings so these so although it's kind of like litigation these are agency proceedings and they're not that expensive and they're very common in foreign countries much more common than in the united states so so you, you can file to cancel other people's marks in foreign countries to get them out of the way. This is typically because they're dead wood not being used, but there may be other reasons. There, there was a huge amount of what we call fraudulent or bad faith filings coming out of and into China and India. And that's in part because people are trying to make money just filing and selling these registrations back to the owners. Uh, part of it was because China's provincial governments were subsidizing filing. So in other words, the provincial government, so a, a certain uh, province in China was trying to, to improve their economic strength and were paying businesses to file trademarks into the United States, for example, uh, to, to show that they, you know, they have uh, more brand protection. And so there was a lot of what the U.S. considered fraudulent filings. And so to get rid of these, we, we, we file what we call cancellation proceedings. And these are not, not very expensive proceedings um, relative to real litigation. Um, and then, of course, there's litigation, which is expensive and, and varies, varies by country. But again, whatever you're considering, ask your foreign counsel how much and how likely am I to win? Because... In general, you'll get you'll get accurate answers and it will help you make the decision. Don't blindly say I'm gonna sue sue somebody, or don't blindly say it's not worth it because it may be worth it. You know, we we have had good successes in the right cases getting rid of bad marks. Okay, so there's a lot of scams out there. This is my last slide. Um what's really common in the United States more than other countries is. As soon as you file for a trademark, you get a letter saying, you know, please pay us five, five hundred or five thousand dollars, and we'll, you know, for this very important registration or publication. And you know, we every time we re we file a trademark application, we send the client an email, and it's highlighted, "Don't pay anybody except us for anything." <laughs> and you know, I'd say five percent of the time they pay somebody because you get this scary letter saying, you know you know pay you know pay this for your registration fee the deadline is this we'll get they'll send letters for renewals saying you know we'll renew your mark the deadline is so and so and the deadline will be one year one year before the real deadline so they'll pay those people and now they won't, don't want them to pay us for the renewal you know so so you got to be really careful um and they they all they have official looking things you know the official trademark bureau just don't don't pay it um particularly particularly in in latin america you'll get solicitations for opposition will say somebody's trying to file the same or similar mark in our country don't you want to oppose well ch ch chances are you don't because you're not going to do business in that country you don't care so you know that's that's for the attorneys to make money that's that's uh conspiracy conspiratorial opposition so well in in latin america sometimes uh the the uh less less credible law firms will make deals between them saying guess what i'm going to pretend to 
oppose your mark so you can make money. We'll share, we'll share, we'll share the, so I'm not trying to say that, all, you know, all, all South American or Latin American law firms are not reputable, but there, there are some instances where there's, you know, um, there, there, there are, are deals brokered to, to generate money from the attorney. So, so make sure if you're, if you're going to South America, you, you're using somebody you can trust. And again, we have, we form relationships with with agencies that, that we believe are honest, and, and then you you don't find that in most most countries, but but we have found that occasionally in Latin America, and then I think we've all gotten the domain name solicitations from China. Generally, they're they're fictitious. They're trying to get you to register a domain name. I mean, it's not expensive. There's nothing wrong with registering your domain name in China with them, but generally they're just trying to get you to register something by pretending somebody else is going to do it before you and then you also have to think why do i need this domain name registration there's so many domain name options out there generally you don't need what somebody's trying to sell you okay so i think that's it yeah so this is absolutely right. excellent I, I do have a question sure um, Many of our Hawaii exporters, especially the newer exporters, let's just say it, it could be a, a jewelry company, a skincare company, an apparel company, something along that line. And it's usually a one, two, three, five person company, something like this. Uh, let's just let's make a fictitious company in Maui. Uh, they make uh, skincare products. Um, small, very small business, and they have some uh, interest in it from Japan, uh, Canada, from some tourists, um, you know, maybe Korea. Just what is your recommendation for that company going forward? Like, what should they do today in terms of intellectual property? Assuming they haven't done anything, even yeah. in the US, they have a nice logo they've created, they have a website. Assuming they haven't even registered that logo here in Hawaii, you know, how, how do they start? Yeah. The well, I mean, I think the problem is there's there's no mini steps that you can take. If you if you're worried about the markets in those foreign countries, the right thing to do is to hire an attorney who can prepare and file a U.S. application and file a Madrid application within six months of that U.S. application, and that's going to cost several thousand dollars and maybe maybe more depending on how many countries but i think it's doable for a few thousand dollars um there's no mini steps because registering in the state of hawaii is not going to really benefit them outside of the state of hawaii a federal registration is going to cost half of the budget of doing a federal plus a madrid um and so you know i think you can get started in the the first six months, I mean, everybody's filing fees. Every attorney will charge a little differently, but I, I think between you can get filed in one class in the United States for between 1000 and 1500 depending on who you're using. And then within six months after that, if you're selecting just a handful of countries, you know, it's probably 2000 or 2500 to file the Madrid for those countries. And then, so there you're, you're first in line, assuming those countries are clear and you might want to get at least a preliminary read on by searching the countries before you start, because if the, if the mark is already registered in those countries, and I can tell you that simple marks ha have already been, you know, common words, chances are you're not going to get it in those countries. But if it's a unique logo, you probably will. Um, it, it would probably have a Hawaiian name. Right. You know. Well, that can, that can go both ways. You know, there's a lot of alohas and throughout Asia registered, uh, certain things have become very popular there, but, but yes, um, a lot of things aren't, aren't, um, I think, uh, we, we filed, there's, there's a, a business downstairs, who, you know, who, who she imports, but, you know, we filed for her in Asian countries and, you know, it, it was, it was, it was a fairly unique name and, uh, we went through and everything except so we got pushback on one of them from a U.S. company. Interestingly, a U.S. cosmetic company had, had something similar out there. So, so we had to start again. Um, but but yeah, that wasn't, you know, the Asian countries didn't have any problem with, 
the filing. It's a US country who had a registration in Japan who had the problem with it. Um, but so, so yeah, so I, th I think there's nothing between, there's, there's nothing really little you can do. Uh, I, su I suppose what you could do in the United States is put a TM next to your product. I mean, that's something you can do in your marketing for free without hiring an attorney, and that'll help you in the United States develop rights and keep other people out. It will not help you in foreign countries. Okay. So. Uh, one other question, I, kind of a comment leading into a question that I've met uh, a few companies here that uh, I consulted to on doing business in Asia. And they have told me that they have worked in, uh, one was Korea, one was Japan. Uh, they, their local representative took the initiative, and let's just call it the XYZ company of Hawaii, took the initiative of registering locally in Hawaii, uh, in Japan and in Korea, trademarks and this sort of thing internet domains and this sort of thing on behalf of the Hawaii company. And then later the relationship soured between the, the, the agent and the Hawaii company. But the agent, local agent, was owned it, everything locally. I mean, how, how would you pronounce it? I was going to... My, I anticipate that that actually... I'll, I'll fix it. I anticipate that I was that gonna put my. Happens. Yeah, we, 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 we've had at least one instance and our client had to buy the mark back. Um, so that that is that happens a lot. Um, and typically in Asia. Um, so number one, don't ever agree with your agent to do that. If your agent asks, say no, you know, we'll 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 pay and have it registered in our name. You know, if you have an agent, you know, say we're going to register and just say no. You know, we will we'll register it, but and we'll pay for it, but it has to be in our name. So that's number one. Don't ever make that mistake. And and if they push back, then you know you have a problem with with your agent. Uh, but there is a provision in the Paris Act that says you know the agent cannot do that. So we talked about uh, the Paris Convention giving famous marks rights. It also gives rights for for agent bad actors. So so if you can show that the agent registered it, knowing it's your mark. Um, there is a provision that they can use in the domestic law. So we had this problem in South Korea with a client. We used that provision as leverage, but we ended up buying it back because it was cheaper than going through the litigation. Uh, but, but you should know there is that provision, and that provision can be used to your benefit. But it's always cheaper to, to not let it happen in the first place. Um, so all right. That's it. There's no further questions uh, yeah. coming in. So. I guess we can wrap it up. Thank you so much, sure. Seth. That was fantastic. And your contact information was up there. I'm going to send around uh, the presentations to the attendees so they'll have your contact information sure. there. But thank you. That was fantastic. Um, with that, I'd like to sign off. This was Rob Hack with the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. Thank you very much for attending. Please check uh, the DBET website at invest.hawaii.gov for uh, upcoming uh, webinars. In April, we have um, a exporting to Canada, a country-specific webinar, as well as exporting to Vietnam, um, which is the first time we've done a Vietnam-specific event. That's later in April uh, the 27th, so please look out for that. Hopefully, we'll see you then. Thank you very much for attending, and have a wonderful rest of your day.